as we, we, we sit here, we go to these panels, we're obviously very concerned about what's happening. It's also important to remember how far the environmental movement has come, uh, how different America is now than it was 20, 40, 30, 50 years ago. We have things like the Clean Water Act, we have things like the Clean Air Act. We've brought species back from the brink with the Endangered Species Act. We've done really amazing things. At the same time, we all know that we're facing enormous new challenges. Um, we face climate change, we face new energy, the choices between new energy sources. We, we, we face a very different political atmosphere than we, than we did 40 years ago. We face a very polarized atmosphere. I think that poses enormous challenges for, for the environmental movement, and that movement itself is, is changing, and, and I think needs to change, and that's what we're going to really be talking about here in the panel. How do we adapt environmentalism? How do we adapt the environmental movement for a new era, for new enormous challenges? Uh, but first, maybe Larry you could talk briefly, and then we'll go down the panel. Sure. Uh, I'm Larry Schwager, and I, I, I'm uh, privileged to be president of the National Wildlife Federation. And just hearing about Barry Commodore, when I was a, a boy, 14 years old, I stood on the beaches of Lake Erie and saw the last of the blue pike uh, dying off in the pollution of Lake Erie. And, and at that time, Barry Commodore wrote a book called The Closing Circle. And one of the chapters in his book was The Death of Lake Erie, where he predicted that Lake Erie would, in fact, die. Well, it didn't die because we took, uh, frankly, a very heroic stand on a Clean Water Act uh, vetoed by Richard Nixon, overridden by the Congress, and we were able in 1972 to get $18 billion worth of funding, which was diverted a lot of it to clean up uh, the Great Lakes. So I know we can get things done, and I, you know, I'm hardly a new environmentalist, but uh, I can tell you that the National Wildlife Federation is uh, ready for the, for the important uh, challenges of this day as we have in the 60s and 70s and in its early past, uh, early days with wildlife conservation. I came back to National Wildlife Federation in 2004. I was interviewed by the board uh, and I told them, I said, unless the organization wants to devote its energies to solving the climate crisis, please don't hire me. And that's how I, I concluded my, my interview and the board, was, the board uh, search committee was rather so shocked by that uh, firm position. But frankly, uh, the scientists at that time were showing that uh, that we would see a very dramatic decline in wildlife across the planet. If temperatures go to two degrees Fahrenheit, we'll lose as many as 37% of the species on the planet. And if you do the math on that, that's around a million species. If it goes to four to seven degrees, we'll lose about 70% of the species on the planet. I think it's hubris to assume that we can throw off the 70% the of the species on the planet without destroying human life. And so I'm uh, deeply committed to uh, being a voice for wildlife, uh, being a voice for wildlife during a time when uh, it's, it's urgent, and focusing on the right issues. I think getting carbon out of our sky is that a right issue. I uh, join with, uh, with, with my colleagues to, to make that point clear, that we have a very short window of time to act and act now. The Federation is working with young people on college campuses. We're doing a number of things with uh, sportsmen and hunters, and even the, the uh, Christian Coalition is one of our partners. So we believe in building a big tent, working together with literally hundreds of organizations to solve this and other important issues. That's great. Ted? Oh, actually, sorry, Bill, actually, you wanted to go first. Yeah. Uh, one, one ever. Um, uh, first of all, what fun to be here. And what fun to hear Dr. Commoner uh, saluted in the beginning. When I was in college, I wrote an the editorial for our college newspaper for the Harvard Crimson endorsing Barry Commoner for President of the United States when he ran in 1980. Um, um, he didn't win. Some guy named Reagan um, um, uh, won, um, but uh, uh, he was a great and powerful uh, uh, thinker. Um, look, I, I don't know about the new, I mean, you've got you know, for the new environmentalists, you've got three guys with receding hairlines up here <laughs> on the, um, um, and mine's been receding faster in the last couple of years as we've tried to, as I've, as Brian says, tried to also do along with writing some organizing. Um, it, it, truth be told, we're losing, and losing pretty badly. The, um, the melt of the Arctic this summer was one of those signal, I mean, we've basically broken one of the four or five largest physical features on Earth. And, and the rest are close behind. When one reads that, um, that the ocean is 30% more acid than it was 40 years ago, one gets a sense of the magnitude of the problem and of the challenge. 
The only thing I can tell you is that one of the ingredients, there are many ingredients, you know, getting policy right, uh, uh, so on and so forth, that other people are more, probably in certain ways, more qualified to talk about than I am, and I'm eager to hear Ted and things. One essential ingredient is having some kind of movement big enough to push the powers that be in the direction, uh, just in the crudest sort of sense, in the direction that we need them to go. And that movement's beginning to build. You know, we started 350 less than five years ago with myself and seven undergraduates and no money. Uh, we still have no money, but now we have uh, operations in every country but North Korea. Um, and we've begun to demonstrate that there is a big worldwide, and, and one of the ways, that, of course, that we've been able to do it uh, largely with no money is because everybody I work with is 25, and they all figured out long ago how to use the tools available to us. Uh, they're not the same tools that people had in 1970. We miss a lot of the societal cohesion that allowed people in groups and networks to pull up things like the first Earth Day, but we're building as fast as we can in other ways, and we're incredibly grateful to everybody for the help with all that work. Great. Uh, thanks, and, and again, really a pleasure to be here. Thanks to uh, South by Southwest for having me um, and having all of us. Uh, it's a great discussion. Um, I guess I would uh, sort of make a couple of observations. Um, you know, uh, my partner, Michael Schellenberg, and I, and I sort of became uh, famous for writing an essay called The Death of Environmentalism. Um, and um, really, that essay, um, as much as being about why environmentalism was failing, um, was about how environmentalism, in our view, would need a change uh, in order to deal with problems like climate change. Um, uh, and you know, I think at the center of that argument is, is um, you know, our view, which is that the sort of contemporary environmentalism as it has evolved over the last three or four decades really is incapable kind of conceptually um, in terms of how we think about the world of dealing with the new great ecological crises that we're faced with. Um, uh, we are well on our way to being a world of 10 billion people. Um, uh, they, uh, they all want to be rich like us. Um, and all of, uh, that's the, the, the central question. Um, that is a generative challenge. It is not a restrictive challenge. Um, the only way you do that is by building, you know, brick by brick, literally, um, uh, uh, windmill by windmill, or nuclear power plant by nuclear power plant, choose your technology of choice, an entire new energy economy entire new agricultural economy. Um, uh, it's a generative challenge. Um, so I think that's the sort of first uh, sort of key takeaway. I think the second uh, 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 key point is that technology uh, is the solution. It's not the problem. There is no path to dealing with any of these problems without radical technological uh, innovation. Um, uh, you can't get here from there. Um, uh, there's uh, climate math and there's also uh, sort of technology math that we really need to come to terms with if we're going to deal with the problem. Um, and then I think the third thing is just more philosophical. Uh, I think it's very easy looking at these problems to um, become very apocalyptic. Um, and I would just remind us that we have risen, not fallen. Everyone sitting in this room lives a um, Arguably, uh, you are the most remarkable human beings who have ever lived on this planet. You, leave, you live lives of just extraordinary opportunity, uh, uh, affluence, freedom, um, to be who you want, to do what you want, to live where you want, to marry who you want. Um, this is remarkable, um, and we should have some gratitude about it. And I think um, there's been a tendency not to want to recognize, actually, um, all that is sort of good in the world and all that is good about modernization for fear that it will make us complacent um, and not want to deal with the problems. But I would argue that it's exactly the opposite, that when we actually express some gratitude for the remarkable lives um, that we live, it actually sparks um, a desire to make the world a better place and a belief that we can do so as opposed to um, a kind of fatalism uh, when we sort of tell these declinist narratives and when we imagine that we've sort of 
fallen from a state of grace in our modern lives. Um, so I think at, at a philosophical level, there's a very different story that we need to be telling about the world that we live in today. Even if we, even if legislation will be able to make those changes, we, we can't seem to get that legislation passed. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, A, why that is, I mean, what, you know, what, why we no longer seem to be able to do that, and is there a way to get that? Because, you know, how do you cross partisan boundaries? I mean, how do you, how do you reach out? Because I know you guys have tried to do that in order to create maybe the kind of legislation that would begin to move us in the right direction. Well, I, I guess I'd just start by asking, uh, are there any climate skeptics in the room? Nobody. Yeah. Um, They're in Austin. Right. So I mean, so I mean, start start there. I mean, you know, we go and do conferences like this, and we all talk to each other about how bad the problem is. Um, and um, you know, uh, there's a whole there are other big rooms like this filled up with people who talk about why it's not a problem at all. Um, and um, we have our scientists, and and you know, we have a scientific consensus that we're right, and they've got a bunch of scientists who. You know, uh, decide decide what you think, and then go find the you know in this in this world in which we live in. You decide what you think, and then you go find the the experts that um, back that up. Um, I think one of the problems with this sort of science based um, argument, the way that 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 science has been deployed tactically in this debate, I think has been problematic. Um, uh, in that, uh, you know, basically what happened is we went to half the country and said, uh, our science says that you have to support this massive expansion of the federal regulatory state. Um, and and, and if, if you don't support that, you're a science denier. Um, and half the country basically said, well, I don't think I like your science. Um, they didn't decide that, therefore, they should go along um, with you know, what was something that was quite ideologically problematic for them. Um, so I would just say that I think that that um, I'm a lot more interested in figuring out how you sort of disrupt these fault lines um, than reinforce them. Um, so here's an example. Um, if, I, if this room was filled with climate skeptics, I could guarantee you that 80% of them would be rabidly pro-nuclear. Um, so uh, if if you really want to try to break up the polarization around this, um, you know, for those of us who are climate advocates and feel great urgency about the problem, I think we would be well served to sort of rethink our kind of um, uh, uh, instinctual uh, opposition um, to nuclear energy. Um, here's another example, even more controversial these days. Um, U.S. emissions are declining faster than any countries in the world, in large part because of fracking, and not just because we've got a lot of cheap gas and therefore it's displacing coal in a market system, but because it puts the wind at the backs of a whole lot of activist efforts. The fact that we have lots of cheap gas makes it lots easier to convince communities, utilities, others to close down coal plants. It made it much easier to get stronger EPA regulations on mercury. Um, there's a bunch of problems with fracking, but when you compare those problems to a set of the problems we have with scaling things like renewable, they're pretty solvable. It's mostly plugging leaks. Bill, frack, you know, I know that you've, you guys have begun to look at fracking and mm -hmm. spend a lot of time on fracking. Um, and clearly, anyone who works in the environment movement knows, I think, that that single issue has generated more grassroots pressure, more grassroots passion, really, than I think anything else, including climate change. And I'm wondering, you know, why is that? And, and do you, you know, I'd like to respond to Ted. I mean, no, I just, yeah, I mean, is it, go ahead. I mean, there's lots of reasons that people are against fracking, most of them having to do with the uh, immediate effects, and they're really horrible on the landscapes where people live. But um, the reason that in the last uh, uh, year or two, uh, most of the people who are excited about it for climate reasons have changed their minds have to do that just that the numbers aren't right. I mean, everybody said, oh, it's the reason our carbon emissions are dropping, but there was a big paper out of Stanford two weeks ago saying, no, it accounts for about 10% of the decline that we've seen in carbon emissions. It's undercutting the move to wind much faster than it's undercutting coal, and at best, it's a kind of fad diet that will, that will put us on a permanent slightly reduced plane of carbon emissions instead of allowing and kind of blocking the transformative breakthroughs that we need. And that's assuming, that's assuming that uh, Ted's right and it's going to be an easy matter to block up the methane leakages into the atmosphere. So if the carbon gets you, I mean, uh, the IEA modeled the whole thing. We convert the entire planet to gas on an absolute critical time scale. What happens to the planet? 
what happens is 660 parts per million CO2 and a temperature increase of almost 4 degrees centigrade. Um, if you don't transition to something yeah, else. Yeah, right? you know, but that's, but, in, in, but that's, that's a, in the process. I mean, that's, they're modeling a system that goes faster than anybody thinks you can you know, even get us onto gas at the moment. Um, um, well, the point is that it's blocking. It's not. It, it, well, it's also worry, worry enabling being, wind, isn't it? Though? No, it's not. I mean, in I this mean, country, it's clearly with, not. Well, it's with cheap exactly backup. Exactly the opposite. Uh, you can't. You uh, can't run a system on wind without without oh, that's, without backing that's the other without thing, backing it up. That's the other thing where the sort of old dogma is giving yeah. way to the new science. In fact, there was a big, uh, 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 big study out of Britain about ten days ago saying, it just looking empirically. Is this what's happening as we're seeing big increases in wind generation? Are we also seeing big increases in gas use as, or, online to back it no, up? I, I, and, I know. and we're not. Uh, it's because we're beginning to lick these intermittency problems, and that's really but good news. Bill, it's the technology that you keep talking but, about but actually, that's uh, helping us just, make Just to be clear, though, what that study found was that, uh, was that the, um, uh, there has been an argument by wind opponents that wind was no better right. than gas. Right. And what that study found was that, in fact, wind is better and than gas. And it wasn't requiring huge amounts of gas to well, make it, it work. Well, it wasn't thought that requiring so much gas to back it up that you were losing the benefits of having yeah, a zero I don't think we're having, I don't think we're having intermittent a system, a huge, right? Huge difference yeah. here. It's clear, I think it's pretty clear at this point that fracking the cheap gas isn't a kind of bridge to the future, which was the rhetoric people kept using, that instead it's sort of building the pier further out, this kind of rickety pier further out into the hydrocarbon lake, you know? I, but I, 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 can I, I just want to say one good. thing, which yeah. is that Bill cites a lot of studies. And, and there's a bunch of studies out there, and it's just what a colleague of mine calls an excess of objectivity. If, if, if you're anti-fracking, you can do a study that shows that there's no benefit whatsoever to this gas. And of course, it's all dependent on how carbon intensive you think a coal plant is going to be in 2070, and whether you assume that gas is a transition to something or it's just gas for all eternity. I've been, Simil well, sim I've sim been similarly. Of, I want to back uh, out sure, of fracking yeah. for a second. I mean, I just, say, I just, I, all I want to say, if I, I can just, say, can I? Accused yeah. of many things, but excess of objectivity yeah. is a new one, and I'm <laughs> yeah. grateful for it. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> all, 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 all I want to point out is that, is that um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, you, can, you can actually look at the, you know, there's studies, people who don't okay. like it say it's had no impact on emissions, or it's only 10%. You know, and I can tell you the eight things that are wrong with the assumptions that go into that. You get people who exaggerate it the other way and say it's all gas, and we clearly it's not that. I think clearly there's there's short and medium term benefits, and the question is what you do with it. But my larger point was just that um, when we kind of react to these things in these sort of immediate, it's it's gas, it's a fossil, so it's bad. Um, uh, and then we go and we find the evidence that supports that. And if you want to break up the polarization, which was to your original question, I think we're really well served to uh, question some of those instincts. Um, okay, Larry, real quick. If, if we'll I might respond, I, I, I'm from Pennsylvania, so I'm living with the fracking, and I understand, Bill, what you're talking about with landscapes. Uh, some of my favorite places, in fact, places that I helped acquire and protect for the Commonwealth are now being butchered. So I, I, I take that very personally. But let me say something about the, the, the gas plants and what we're doing. We're spending right now about, a, last time I checked, about $130 billion building new gas-fired power plants that are going to be around probably 30 to 50 years. And we're going to create stranded costs instead of taking those same dollars and investing in wind. And I, I, one example of what's happened to wind as a result of this, Vestas uh, uh, Wind Company, which is the largest wind manufacturer in the world, their stock has gone from $42 a share down to $2. You can go out tomorrow and buy their shares for $2 on the market. And that tells me a lot about what's happening to the wind industry as a result of our dash to gas. And so in my mind, there is a serious problem here. We need to recognize it, understand that we're betting on a fuel that will not protect our children's future, and instead of investing in those technologies that will give our kids a safe landing. Bill. Since, as someone who, who is obviously building a, a movement and, and both online but also out in the streets and, and several times, and you, we just talked earlier today about a, a protesters who were arrested at, at, a, at a protest. A, why is that, why is that value? Why is building that movement value? But, but more also, once you have it, what do you do with it? Well, those are, like that to, to those are both excellent questions that I might just have time to answer before I've got to leave here. Um, 
look, uh, uh, you build movements because the other side on this fight is incredibly powerful and incredibly rich. They have all the money. Exxon made more money last year than any company in the history of money, okay? I'm, I, I'm no theologian, I'm a mere Sunday school teacher, but they have more money than God, all right? So <laughs> one looks for alternate currencies to try and balance some of that power somehow, and those alternate currencies are passion and spirit and creativity, they're reason and, and science, and you know, sometimes, yeah, you have to spend your body too, you know? But I mean, look, for example, at what ha what's going on with this tar sands thing. Last June, our most important climatologist, Jim Hansen, says, you know what, people might want to pay attention to this because the economically recoverable reserves from this thing make it the second largest pool of carbon in the world. Um, it would not be a good idea to do it. If we burn all that on top of everything else we're burning, then it's game over for the climate, was how he put it. And you can see how that's true when you look at you know, the kind of stuff, the numbers I laid out in, in Rolling Stone this, uh, this summer. We have, at the current rate of burning carbon, we go past the two degree mark in 16 years of burning carbon. The last thing we need is lots more of it. But that stopped no one in government or industry. Uh, the only thing that slowed them down, and maybe probably only temporarily, but at least for a little while, and at least made it an issue, was movement building. So when 1,253 people were willing to go get arrested, yeah, you know, maybe it owes something to the civil rights movement, um, um, but it was the moment at which uh, this suddenly became a national issue. You know, Brian hadn't gotten to write about it before, and then suddenly he could, you know, and so on and so forth. And we began to, and, and look what's happened in the time since. The Canadians have begun to search their own souls about this in a serious way. I think they've got the pipeline to the Pacific blocked uh, uh, going out of the tar sands. The uh, money that's in the tar sands is a hell of a lot shakier than it was. Uh, people are reluctant to make new investments. Now, they've still got the huge advantage, and after the election, I'd say the odds are uh, much too high that they're gonna get the Keystone Pipeline built, but we've clearly slowed down some of that. And you can't just give up uh, on this and say, well, they're gonna cut down the Amazon anyway, let's just talk about the, in fact, Look at what people in Brazil have managed to do. When Marina Silva, who was the Green Party candidate in the last election, ran, it was not like Ralph Nader running. She won 20% of the vote. Here's a rubber tapper from uh, uh, you know, the middle of the Amazon, and she won 20% of the vote. Um, they've got a huge and building environmental movement, and it's done some remarkable things. Uh, uh, the Amazon is in endlessly better uh, 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 more intact than people thought it would be 10 or 15 years ago, and it's not for any other reason than people building powerful movements, uh, and for good scientists working through things like the Nature Conservancy. I mean, I, you know, I'm on the board of the Adirondack Conservancy, I like them, uh, uh, and Larry ran them in Pennsylvania, you know, you know, argument with us about any of that, but you know, that kind of, it doesn't happen without people being uh, uh, alarmed, and if it, you know, sometimes it, uh, you know, sort of offends. People. It's like, oh, it's too almost too much like the '60s. It's too whatever. Uh, uh, we obviously know how to work in the 21st century. We use those tools, mm -hmm. but the old tools too. The tools, in essence, that remind us that there is a deep moral challenge here a moral challenge as well as a technological and a practical and financial and whatever kind of challenge. In fact, it's the biggest moral challenge in that dimension that we've ever faced. The decisions we make in the next very short order determine what life is gonna be like for those 10 billion people and also for the you know, completely conceivable 30 or 40 billion who will follow over the next millennia or two, you know? It's gonna determine what life is like for the rest of creation. These are big challenges, and to just say, ah, oh, it's, you know, don't play the sort of 60s stuff, it's too, you know, uh, 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 to be too grown up for that, is um, um, that's as much a mistake as assuming that that's the only thing that one needs to do. Uh, it's this collaboration. <laughs> And with yeah. that, I've got to take it off. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you, brother. Good luck.